Hello, everybody. On behalf of uh, Helsinki Environmental Humanities Hub, we welcome all attendees, all participants of our uh, of our workshop uh, from various disciplines and uh, different fields. And we think, but uh, that if you are here uh, now at this moment, that's why we we suggest that you have some interest how to make research methods low carbon, how to decarbonize research activities, and how to apply the carbon management to your research, to your own research methodology. Welcome to our energy and humanities session uh, to um, low carbon research methods workshop, which we are having today. Uh, today, our guest is Low Carbon Research Method Group, uh, funded by the Canadian Research Chair Program. The activities of this group are the academic response to climate change agenda and the coming energy transitions. Their initiative demonstrates the uh, potential of low carbon research methods to reshape use um, unjust and unsustainable, unsustainable research practices. Today, our guest, guest is Kate Elliott. Mm -hmm. uh, some words about Kate. Uh, she is an educator and interdisciplinary doctoral candidate at Simon, Simon Fraser University. Her, uh, Kate has background in urban studies and now her research uses virtual um, uh, collaborative storytelling techniques to trace the life of grocery carts. It is some words about your research, uh, your research project. Uh, but now, uh, Kate is going to uh, Kate is going to provide some information and involve us in the discussion on low carbon research methods. Kate, you are welcome. Thank you so much, Ina. I'm just going to share my slides and begin. Thank you all so much for being here today. This is really exciting uh, for me. Um, such a great opportunity and also an, a great opportunity to be able to travel virtually around the world um, to meet other people and share what I'm learning with others uh, without actually hopping on an airplane. So first of all, I'd like to offer gratitude to all those at Helsinki Environmental Humanities for organizing this conference. Uh, and to the University of Helsinki, in particular, Victor Pal, Inna Hakkinen, and Emma de Carvalho, who have so warmly welcomed this workshop. It's a real pleasure to share a space with Inna, uh, who I first met in a virtual space last summer for a carbon wayfinding discussion. And thanks also to IHME, who generously funded the work that has gone into organizing this month of events that has brought us all together. It is a real pleasure to be here, and I offer a special note of gratitude to Alexandra Lekind, with whom all of these materials that you'll see in the workshop were co-developed um, over the summer during our Low Carbon Institute. Alexandra is unable to be here today. She was supposed to co-present with me, um, but is present in the workshop materials and in the reflective framework of this session and the speculative low carbon dreaming that we hope that you will carry with you when you leave this workshop space. And as I'll explain later, this workshop uses wayfinding as a means of reflecting on and appreciating what we love, what makes us feel good in our life and in our work, and finding our way to honor those things through low carbon practices. This workshop is not about giving up the things that we love, but rather about identifying and protecting them. For me, one of those things is forests. And when I think about Finland, I think about forests. I had an opportunity in grad school in 2017 to examine the Finnish forest industry, and it reminded me of my childhood uh, in Mackenzie, a small forest industry town in the McLeod Lake region um, that you see pictured here. The upper green circles on both maps show the forest areas where I spent my childhood, forests that were loved and cared for by the McLeod Lake Indian Band and their ancestors from time out of mind. The map on the right is a map of the province where I live. Um, and it is an indigenous map that honors First Nations and the lands that they still steward. I now live in the lower green circle in a city known as Vancouver. 
And this is the land where my university was established on the territories of the Musqueam, Squamish and the tsleil people. My university, Simon Fraser University, is named for an explorer who colonized these lands and removed the rights of indigenous people. The elders have passed down these stories so that we know this history. And both the municipality and the mountain where the universities sit are named for a British merchant and politician, Robert Burnaby. Becoming aware of the colonial erasures through acts like renaming of lands is an important practice for people from my part of the world and I know also from parts of yours. This awareness forms part of the wayfinding practices that Alexandra and I have hoped will result in restorative forms of justice. And later in this workshop, I'll ask you all to dream big, to imagine what might be possible in a world where low carbon practices are simply part of a larger ethical way of being, of recognizing and nurturing the things that we love. And for me, this dream includes taking back the Squamish name for the mountain and applying it to my university. The Squamish name for this place um, is based on a tree that I love, one that exists only along the west coast of North America and in Australia, the Arbutus tree, whose bark crickles in sunlight and peels away in curls like brown paper. The Squamish call this place Tlukluquitin, for the place where the bark is peeled. Alexandra introduced me to this piece by the artist Wendy Redstar, and this piece is complex in both its context and its form, shown at the 2021 New York Art Fair at the Armory. In 2020, art sales online reached 12.4 billion, and they were hoping to have this in-person event increase profit with high net worth collectors coming to New York City in 2021. Wendy Redstar's piece and practice exemplify the complex entanglements of injustices that result from high carbon practices and the ways of life built on specific types of alienation. During the Low Carbon Summer Institute that Alex and I, Alexandra and I offered, um, we showed Wendy Redstar's work as an invitation to grapple with her question, how do we move forward? We hope that low carbon approaches can also activate a move away from settler colonial logics um, that see land as property and materials as resources and commodities. Extraction in all its guises is fundamental to our concerns today. So here is a shape of the session. Um, in today's session, I'll offer first a brief explanation of the evolution of wayfinding for restorative methods. And I will invite you to steal this idea and to improve it. Alexandra and I co-developed this guided reflection method in the hopes that others would like it, that participants would take it and use it in their own circles with colleagues and students, and that people would improve it and circle back to share with us their improved version. So please steal this idea and stay in touch. And in order to be able to steal this idea, you'll need to know what it is. So you'll spend about 30 minutes in pairs in breakout rooms, guiding each other through the questions. And if you choose, you can share responses to some of the questions on a shared Jamboard. And Ina will help me by posting the link later on in the chat. And then I'll share some of the themes that emerged for Alexandra and me during our low carbon office hours. And we'll see what themes emerged for all of you as well. And finally, Together, we'll collaboratively share some of the tensions that we all face when we try to lower carbon. And we'll take up the suggestion of one of our summer participants who asked if perhaps we actually need another language to talk about carbon. So just to give a bit of background, the Summer Institute began with Anne Pasek and the Low Carbon Research Methods Group, which comes together to look more closely at carbon embedded in our research activities. For instance, Zoom is a corporation whose services have been purchased by an academic institution manifesting in multiple carbon uh, harms that are not immediately visible to us. And Alexandra and I worked together this summer. Um, we were, uh, as we worked together, we were aware of being in two different politically bounded countries on opposite sides of a shared continent in very different localities. And this prompted us to ask, how should we honor both the local and the global dimensions of these topics 
And I should mention that at the time of the Low Carbon Summer Institute, Alexandra had successfully defended her PhD at the University of Wisconsin-Madison and was preparing to embark on one of her, her, the first of her two postdoc positions at the University of Cambridge in the UK. And I was and still am, as Ina explained, a PhD candidate preparing to gather multi-sided collaborative storytellers around a virtual campfire. So both Alexandra and I were entangled in the local, the global, and in the digital. At the beginning of this presentation, <clears throat> I shared about the land where I'm located and made visible a bit of its history. But as we gather in online spaces, we also need to shift our attention to the digital structures and technologies that allow us to connect and conduct our work across disparate geographies and time zones. Our data is stored and routed from one or more data centers. As this data makes its way to you across different informational and energy infrastructures, it inhabits occupied, ceded, and unceded lands predicated on histories of colonial dispossession in initiating the low carbon wayfinding reflective spaces, Alexandra and I hope that our continued conversations will activate methods for decolonization. This is Anne Pasek's website, which happens to be down at the moment, but which off operates using the solar protocol. And so it is actually powered by the sun and in that way tries to um, enact uh, more, more justice um, by not taking up harmful forms of energy. And as Low Carbon Research Methods Group uh, visiting scholars, Alexandra and I co-created the 2022 Summer Institute, bringing together international scholars and artists, representing a wide range of disciplines, to think more about the ways that all of our practices intersect with carbon intensive expectations and norms, and to consider alternatives. And it's clear to us that people, people desire more support when it comes to conducting low carbon research. In September alone this year, there were myriad workshops, some run by the Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm, KTH, focused on low flying academia, and a series of activist scholar talks hosted by CGHR, the Center of Governance and Human Rights, on contested data territories and grassroots action to reduce impacts of servers. And we've been grateful for our own systems of support and inspiration, including the Limits Permacommuting Community, introduced to us by Brian Sutherland, and warmly stewarded by conveners like Alina Erickson and Lisa Nathan, who implement the art of hosting in their virtual conferences. We're also guided by the relational insights of fellow Low Carbon Research Methods group members, Michelle Bastian, Shirley Roburn, and Zoe Hayne Jones. <clears throat> In conversation with Anne Pasek, Alexandra and I articulated goals for the Summer Institute using the term wayfinding. And we see this as a means to navigate institutional and ideological demands of research alongside the life, the precarities of life in petroleum-fueled late capitalism. Building on feminist ethics of care and our respective asset-based educational pedagogies, we determined that we were wayfinding to foster what we call restorative methods. These are roots towards methods that could be restorative to both the practitioner and to the planet. This moment requires us to think low carbon, to account for carbon in the atmosphere and to make reparations for damages done. Yet scholars who want to do research differently are often told to wait, wait until after your dissertation, until you are a professor, until you have tenure, wait until you find the right department, until you are financially stable. But the message that we should wait to do the work that we love to build a more just world is untenable. And wayfinding is an invitation to stop waiting. The Summer Institute asked, what does it look like to encourage restoration to navigate the disciplining of our work and alienation from our bodies? What are the waypoints that support necessary culture change? So in July and August this year, we asked researchers to sign up for one hour to come to virtual office hours so that they could reflect on their research process and consider the carbon embedded in it. Our slots filled up quickly with artists, activists, and academics, graduate students, tenured faculty, and senior practi seasoned practitioners. 
Since wayfinding for restorative methods is an ongoing approach, we did not see office hours as one-offs. We designed them as openings for people to connect. And almost all participants came to, to the group workshops to meet and learn from one another and advance the broader mission of just decarbonization. So one of the challenges of inviting people to talk about the carbon in their research processes is to ensure that they don't feel threatened. Often an invitation to a climate conscious discussion is filled with emotions of guilt and shame. And people often assume that they are going to be asked to give up what they love. Alexandra and I agree with Adrian Marie Brown that there is no way to, to repress pleasure and expect liberation. Imagining a better world motivated by love can be powerful um, in confronting unpredictable, tragic, and scary things. And our goal with office hours was to create a safe, non judgmental space and to ask open ended questions that guide people to critically reflect on the ways they make and share their research. Along the way, we stopped to reflect on where there might be carbon, both the visible and the invisible. And some people showed up hoping for a low carbon recipe to follow. However, for us, the wayfinding process is relational. We encourage people to see carbon action as ongoing. It requires continued reflection and discussion. I invite you to experience the reflective practice that we guided in our low carbon office hours. So in a couple of moments, um, I'm going to invite you in pairs to join a breakout room. And once there, you'll introduce yourselves following the prompts on the Jamboard, and you'll work your way through 12 reflective questions. Alexandra and I divided these into the five following categories that you can see here on, on one of the sample Jamboards. Methods, how you make and do your work. Sharing, how you share your work goals and constraints, carbon concerns, and finally, that magical what if. What might a low carbon world make possible for you and for others? When Alexandra and I guided people through these questions, the process usually took the whole office hour time and sometimes longer. So we would go through the questions in order, guiding people through their making and sharing processes. And then we'd take time to post follow-up questions and dig deeper. You won't have that kind of time in this workshop. So today's session is just to offer you a taste of what we did, along with a bit of hands-on participation in the process. And we hope you'll take this away with you and that you will actually steal this idea and use it in your own institutions and academic spaces and make it better and then come back and tell me about it. Um, you'll be in your breakout rooms for only about half an hour. And I encourage you and your partner to start with the introductions prompt and after that, to take a quick look at all the questions and decide how you'd like to proceed. For example, you might decide to start from the beginning and take turns, perhaps one person answering the first question and the other answering the second and so on. Or you may decide to focus on fully reflecting on certain questions, um, each of you sharing responses and seeing how far you get in that half hour. However you choose to engage with the questions is up to you. And so is how you engage with the Jamboard. You'll all have the Jamboards to give you the questions. They're all posted there. Um, and everyone can write in them or post little post-its and everyone can see them. So adding comments or answers to these pages is very welcome, but entirely optional. I know that sometimes we get involved in interesting conversations and we forget that we should be posting something or that there's a note taking opportunity, there's zero pressure for you to do this entirely optional. But if there are many comments, um, and you'd like to add something, but you can't find space anymore, you can use some of the empty pages at the back of this Jamboard starting on page 15. Um, and I'll give you a 10 minute warning uh, so that you have time to discuss any remaining questions or to share remaining thoughts with your breakout room partners before coming back to the larger Zoom room when we'll be looking at some themes that emerged. I will not be come, floating in parachuting into your breakout rooms. I'll be lurking in the Jamboard pages, but I'll be here in the main room um, if you run into technical difficulties. And it will take me about two minutes to organize all of you into the breakout rooms. While I'm doing that, please feel free to look through the Jamboard questions. And Ina's gonna post them in the chat now. So just make sure that you have, um, that you have the ability to access those. 
well, I am going to unshare my screen and oh, maybe I can actually do no, I'm going to unshare my screen um, and put you into to breakout rooms while you're looking at the Jamboard pages. If you cannot access the Jamboard pages, please let us know in the chat.